The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. As I said in my email, tonight we're starting a new series. Once or twice a month for much of this year, we'll be looking at this book of Hosea. Hosea is the first of 12 books at the end of the Old Testament that we call the Minor Prophets. That does not mean that they are minor in importance, of course, but merely in size, in contrast to the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. These books as well, 12, are very important, and we can see that from the fact that the New Testament writers quote them often, including this one. In fact, we were looking, weren't we, a few weeks ago, at Christmas time at Hosea 11, verse 1, out of Egypt I called my son. The minor prophets are not in strict chronological order, although Hosea is one of the earliest of them. And of course, he comes first. Now, the prophet who wrote this book and lived and ministered in the late 8th, 8th century BC, that's 755 to 722 or thereabouts BC. And that last year, 722, that was the end of the northern kingdom of Israel. At that point, it was conquered by the Assyrians and the people taken into captivity throughout their empire. So this is a late 8th century BC prophet. And Hosea's mission was primarily to this people, to the ten tribes who broke away from Judah after the reign of King Solomon, you remember. Because for all of their sin, never mind all that, the Lord still loved them. And that comes through very clearly in this prophecy of Hosea, as you may know. In the New Testament, John has been dubbed the Apostle of Love, hasn't he? Well, even so, in the Old Testament, Hosea has been called the Prophet of love, the love of the Lord for the children of Israel. The name Hosea means salvation. It's the same Hebrew root as Joshua and Jesus, of course. Indeed, Joshua's original name was Hosea. If you remember, Moses changed it to Joshua, the Lord saves. That's in Numbers 13, 16. Now, if I asked you to tell me one thing about this prophet, Hosea, you would almost certainly say, he is the one God told to marry a prostitute. And you'd be correct. Look at verse 2. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So this man's marriage was to be a living parable of the relationship between God and Israel. Most unusual, and certainly for him, very painful. And yet, how powerful for those who heard him. What a powerful way of communicating this truth about how God felt about his people who had been unfaithful to him. So we're going to start working our way through this book in earnest a fortnight today, God willing. But tonight I want to set the scene by taking a brief look at the background, Hosea's historical context. This is, after all, what we are given in that first verse. We have there five or six kings, if we include Joash, mentioned one king of Israel in the north, Jeroboam, and the others kings of Judah in the south. Just remember that Hosea was preaching in the northern kingdom, so it's perhaps a bit unusual that all those Judean kings should be mentioned, and just one of the Israelite kings. In fact, he ministered throughout the reigns of several Israelite kings, not just Jeroboam. But of those kings in verse 1, I have chosen three to take a closer look at to help us get an idea of the sort of times in which Hosea was ministering. And those three are, in order, Jeroboam, Uzziah, and Jotham that we read about. And together they will give us a good idea of what it was like for Hosea, what life was like for him and for his people. And indeed, each of them in his own right has something important to teach us as well. So let's begin with Jotham, sorry, Jeroboam. The names do get a bit complicated, don't they? A little bit similar to each other. Jeroboam. So we read of him in our first reading in 2 Kings 14, 23 to the end of that chapter. Although he is mentioned last in Hosea 1, verse 1, 
He actually came first before the other kings that are mentioned. He reigned 41 years over Israel in the north from approximately 793 to 753 BC. and His capital was Samaria. He was, of course, the second Israelite king to bear the name Jeroboam. The first, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was the one God chose to be ruler over the breakaway ten northern tribes. That was way back in 931 BC. And this is around 795 BC. This Jeroboam, uh, the one that we're looking at, he was the son of Joash. And doubtless his father named him after that first Jeroboam, which was not exactly a, an inspired choice of name, given it was that first Jeroboam who had set Israel on the path of idolatry from which they never returned. And Jeroboam the second followed in his footsteps. Verse 24 of that chapter 2 Kings 14. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, his namesake, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. So we're looking here at a wicked king, as they all were in the north, in the northern kingdom of Israel. Not a single one of them was good. But in spite of this, though he was a failure spiritually, militarily, he was successful. Look at verse 25. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath, that's far in the north near Syria, to the Sea of the Arabah, or the Dead Sea, in the south, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from gath Hefer. Yes, that's the same Jonah who was swallowed by the fish, and he went to Nineveh reluctantly. He's not a fictional character, you see, and that's not a made-up event. He did not want to go to Nineveh, Jonah, lest God spare those pagans. By contrast, I expect he was only too happy to prophesy about Israel's reclaiming their territory from their enemies, getting their land back. But be that as it may, we should notice who was really responsible for Jeroboam's success in warfare. It wasn't he himself. What does verse 26 say? For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter. And whether bond or free, there was no helper for Israel. No helper besides himself. Their enemies were cruel, the Syrians, the Assyrians and so on. But their God was kind. Likewise, look at verse 27. And the Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. But he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. There are two things to learn from this. Firstly, when God chastens his children, it isn't because he hates them. Rather, it's because he loves them. Then why, you say, does he do it? He does it to bring them, to bring us, to our senses, to repentance, to convince us of the error of our ways. That does not mean his discipline will always have the desired effect. It did not here. But still, that is the Lord's motive. Nor will he ever allow his elect to go too far past the point of no return. For example, he never said that he would destroy all the Israelites, as the writer makes a point of saying. He did not say that he would destroy all of them. On the contrary, he promised always to preserve a remnant of them. 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal, or if they have, then never again. As Hosea says in chapter 14, verse 8, Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? God brings them back to himself. It was like that in the Apostle Paul's time, if you remember. As he says in Romans 11, and so it is today, a remnant according to the election of grace. Have you and I not also experienced the same thing? God's restoring grace through, often, affliction. Like the psalmist says, Psalm 119, it is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your testimonies. I know, O Lord, that in righteousness you have afflicted me, that all your judgments are right. Hallelujah, what a saviour. So that's the first thing to learn from Jeroboam. That when God chastens his children, the Israelites in this case, it is not because he hates them, but rather because he loves them. And likewise with us. And secondly, notice who God used to bring about this deliverance. It was, again, by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. 
The man who did evil in the sight of the Lord. An apostate idolater. Not a knight in shining armour, this man. In fact, only rarely does God act directly to judge the wicked, like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone from heaven. More often, he uses means to punish his enemies, instruments of judgment. And some of those means are, if you'll forgive the pun, pretty mean themselves, pretty horrible people, who will eventually receive their own judgment, and we'll see that next time in connection with Jehu. But for now, let us not stumble at this fact that the Lord uses evil men to judge evil men. We must not imagine he is restricted to the United Nations with their blue helmets or to democratically authorized Western forces today. The Lord works all things together according to the counsel of his own will. And so he brings his will to pass. Going back to our first verse in Hosea, Jeroboam is the only northern king who's mentioned there, as I say. And his long reign was the longest of any of those northern kings. And that too was thanks to the Lord's mercy. Jeroboam was the great grandson of Jehu. <coughs> he was Jehu, well he was the man who God chose to annihilate the house of Ahab. This is an example again of that very thing of God using evil men to judge other evil men. And he did his work with, with gusto. And God promised him in return a dynasty that would last for four generations. We read in connection with Zechariah in 2 Kings 50. And that is what he received, no more, no less. Because Hosea began his ministry towards the end of Jeroboam's reign, in fact. And he was still going strong when Zechariah succeeded his father. We read of him, as I say, in 2 Kings 15. But how long did Zechariah last? A mere six months, half a year, not even a year. And why did he last only that long? Because he too did evil in the sight of the Lord. Had he bucked the trend, had he done what was right, then he might have reigned for longer than that. And God may even have extended the dynasty of Jehu, who knows? But actions have consequences, not just for individuals and families, but also for whole nations. From this point on, the northern kingdom grows ever more chaotic and there's assassination and then assassination. A king reigns for a few years and then dies and then his heir is assassinated and so on. They had some six kings over 30 years. And Hosea prophesied throughout this period to this northern kingdom. So it cannot have been easy. We see that even in the darkest of times, God has his witnesses. Are we living in dark days? And may he use us, may we be his faithful witnesses, the light in the darkness, God helping us. So that's the first king and his background in connection with Hosea. Let's look secondly at one of the kings of Judah, Uzziah. Uzziah, who I think is the first Judean king and the first king to be mentioned in Hosea 1 verse 1. We read of Uzziah or Azariah, as he's called in 2 Kings 15, that in the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. Now that is a super long reign. That's almost 10, yeah, over 10 years more than uh, Jeroboam. And I think... I'm right in saying that's the longest reign of any of the kings of Israel or Judah. To whom did he owe that longevity? To the Lord, of course. And why did God bless him with this long reign? Because, verse 3, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. We're told more of Uzziah's heroics and his exploits in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, often the Count in Chronicles, at least when it refers to Judah, where it focuses, fills out the picture for us. 2 Chronicles 26, we're told there that Uzziah sought God in the days of another prophet called Zechariah, not the one who was in the Minor Prophets much earlier. This man, Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and he assisted the king as the prophet was supposed to do. And as long as Uzziah sought the Lord, we're told God made him to prosper. And so he made war with 
Israel's enemies with the Philistines, the Arabians and the Munites. And the Ammonites also, we read, paid him tribute. He had this great army, standing army of over 300,000 men. They were fully equipped with weapons the king provided. Didn't have to bring their own. He also built many fortifications and heavy weapons like crossbows and catapults. And he dug many wells in all sorts of terrain. And he invested deeply in agriculture. We're told that he loved the soil. He was like a farmer king, but like King George, the third uh, of this country. And unsurprisingly, Isaiah became famous, we're told, as far as the entrance of Egypt. His fame spread abroad to foreign lands. Judah's greatest king since Jehoshaphat, or perhaps even Solomon, so it seemed. Some may have even wondered, could this even be the Messiah, David's son and David's lord? Isaiah Azariah. Well, of course, he wasn't the Christ. And that is evident from a couple of things in these verses. Number one, although Isaiah did well spiritually and not just militarily, he was not perfect in righteousness. If you look at verse four, the high places were not rem removed. These altars originally to pagan gods that were in elevated places nearer to heaven, I think the idea was, they stayed there, the people still sacrificed and burned incense on them. Possibly from now on only to the Lord and not to idols. But even so, it was not what God wanted, was it? He had made that very clear through Moses, way back in Deuteronomy chapter 12. You shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses, out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. There you shall go. That was Zion, Jerusalem, the temple. Try as he might, if he did try, Isaiah could not persuade his people only to worship in the temple there were very few kings who could manage that and the second defect with Isaiah even greater his greatest failure came later on in his life as I'm sure you know it was not as we might have thought when he was weak but on the contrary when he was strong how so well because then as so often happens his heart was lifted up and you know what the proverb says. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. His heart was lifted up. He became proud, conceited, arrogant. His strength, his power, which was good. God had given it to him for his righteousness, but it went to his head. And in his royal arrogance, his hubris, he took a most brazen step. He himself went into the temple. Not just into the you know, outer court where he was permitted to go with other Israelites, but into the holy place itself where only the priests were to go. He went there with a censer in his hand to burn incense on the altar. Which, as you know, that was forbidden to all except the priests, the sons of Aaron, the tribe of Levi. Nobody could take that honor upon himself, not even a son of David from the royal tribe of Judah, not even a righteous king like this one. And we're told there in 2 Chronicles 26, which again fills out uh, the short account in 2 Kings, we're told that some courageous priests opposed him, about 80 of them. They didn't take, they didn't accept what he was doing, and he wasn't pleased with them. He became angry with them. And as he was raging at them, leprosy all of a sudden broke out over his forehead. This is 2 Chronicles 26:19. As our reading in 2 Kings 15 says, this was the Lord's doing. Verse 5, the Lord struck the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death. And so he dwelt in an isolated house. Lepers were shunned because they were ceremonially impure. And indeed, physically you could catch that disease off them. It was infectious. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the royal house, judging the people of the land. He became the co-regent. And with that tragic episode, friends, Isaiah's story comes to an end. He saw out his days in seclusion. He was buried in a field, not in the normal royal tombs. In fact, apparently, I'm not sure when, but a stone plaque was discovered in Jerusalem with the inscription, here lie the bones of King Isaiah, do not open. And perhaps he said, do not open, not just because you shouldn't disturb the, the bones of, of anyone, let alone a king, but maybe because of the leprosy as well. 
But those were found whether they were genuinely uh, his bones or not. But that was the man who was on the throne of Judah for much of Hosea's ministry. For the first part of his reign, Isaiah would have been a great encouragement to Hosea the prophet. However bad things might be in the north, in the south, Hosea could see there is a son of David, a man after God's own heart, judging in righteousness, keeping the faith. And the prophet could point to him as an example for his own people to follow. How encouraging. But sadly, that encouragement did not last. Uzziah's trespass, going into the temple, must have come as a huge disappointment to Hosea. No doubt he said with David, Lord, how the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perish. We see that the best of men are men at best, sinners needing a saviour. So let King Uzziah be a warning to us, brothers and sisters. We can start very well in the Christian life in the race that's set before us, only to finish poorly, very badly. Thank God we cannot lose our salvation if we've truly been saved. The Lord in his mercy will keep us from falling that far. We can, however, ruin our testimony, weakening the hands of the saints and giving great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Past usefulness is no guarantee of future faithfulness. We stand by faith, so let us carry on having faith. Faith that works by love. Love that keeps the commands of God. We will know God's goodness if we continue in his goodness, as Paul says. Otherwise, we also will be cut off. God is faithful and merciful, but let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Even as Isaiah did. So that's another king. Who reigned while Hosea prophesied. And thirdly and lastly let's consider Jotham. Because it's always nice to be able to finish on a positive isn't it. And that is exactly what we have here with this final king. As we have been reminded in our reading. He was the son of Uzziah. He took over the running of the kingdom before his father died because of his leprosy. And during that time the co-regency and also afterwards when he became king in his own right. We're told in verse 34 of 2 Kings 15 that Jotham did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Isaiah had done before he went haywire. 2 Kings actually gives us very little detail about Jotham's righteousness. 2 Chronicles 27 is a short chapter entirely dedicated to Jotham. And what we read there is most encouraging. 2 Chronicles 27, we're told in verse 3, he built the upper gate of the house of the Lord and he built extensively on the wall of Ophel. It's all in Jerusalem. Moreover, he built cities in the mountains of Judah and in the forests he built fortresses and towers. He didn't forget the, the provinces. He also fought with the king of the Ammonites and defeated them and the people of Ammon gave him in that year 100 talents of silver, 10,000 cores of wheat, 10,000 of barley. The people of Ammon paid this to him in the second and third years also. Very much like his dad, as he had been in his youth, defeating the Ammonites. Though it seems Jotham never became quite as great as Isaiah had become. But that's okay. Because unlike Isaiah, Jotham remained steadfast to the end. Verse 6 of 2 Chronicles 27. So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. And as far as we know... That is how he continued right until the end. To the end of his life. Which, as it happens, was not actually all that long. He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned only 16 years in Jerusalem. So he was 41 or so when he died, younger than me. Far short of his father's lifespan, lived to about 68. But again, it's not how long you live that matters, but how well you live. And above all, how you end your life. Jotham ran well. And he finished well. Thanks be to God. The secret of his success. It's not a secret. It's there again in verse 6. He became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. That is, he lived as in his sight. Conscious of the Lord's gaze on all his ways. 
He didn't try to hide anything from him. He knew that that was impossible. Instead, he opened his heart to his maker, actively seeking his face, confessing his sins, forsaking them, believing God's promises and keeping his commandments. That is what it means to prepare one's ways before the Lord, to live as in his sight. And that is what Jotham, King Jotham did. The rest of his acts, his wars and his ways, they're written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, we're told. However, all we really need to know is right here. In that sixth verse of 2 Chronicles 27, he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. Is that how it is with us? Do you and I prepare our ways before the Lord? Do we live as in his sight? Because that is truly what we are. The eyes of the Lord are always upon us. They run through all the earth on the evil and on the good, keeping watch. How do we prepare for death? For that last battle by preparing our ways before God, by trusting in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and walking following him. Jotham, though he was better than his father, neither was he the Messiah, of course. The high places remained even in his days. And also, we should note his son Ahaz, who was also another king who reigned while Hosea preached, Ahaz, who succeeded him, turned out to be the worst king Judah had had until that point. Awful. And it may be unfair to blame Jotham at all for how his son turned out, but one does have to wonder, did he neglect discipline in the home? Did he take care for himself but not for his child? Who knows? But sadly, that's what happened. The best of men are men at best. And Jotham... In his righteousness, he's a good example. In his failure, he shows us we need a better king even than this. We need one who is separate from sinners and yet the friend of sinners. And that king is coming, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hosea prophesied of him. Out of Egypt, God said, I called my son. And that is the king the prophet looked for and that we look for as well. There's more places than that in the book of Hosea that speak of Christ, as we shall see. So this is the background to Hosea. In a fortnight, God willing, we'll begin to look at chapter 1 in earnest. At this love story that is the prophecy of Hosea. The love of the Lord for the children of Israel. And may God help us to learn important lessons from the lives of these three kings. Amen.